This could only have been painted by a madman, at least according to the artist himself. Hi, welcome to Stories of Art. My name is Karel Huidekoper and today we're going to have a look at one of the most iconic images ever made. I'm talking of course about The Scream by Edvard Munch. It has been hailed as the first expressionist work of art and even as the first work of true modern art. And it's certainly one of the most famous images ever made and for good reason. I mean, can you look at this and forget it? I don't think so. You tend to carry this with you in your mind somehow. Now, usually when I make these videos, I talk to you about stuff that I really like, the sort of thing that I like to look at. Because let's face it, the whole point of these videos is to help you enjoy art more. And the way to do it, in my opinion, is to share the things that I love. But in this case, it's slightly different because I'm not so sure whether or not I even like this picture. Because let's face it, it's not a pretty picture. You might even go so far as to call it ugly. But then that specific ugliness was precisely the point. In fact, it was very much embraced by Munch himself. And even though, or maybe because of the fact that it's not pretty, that is what makes it so very, very fascinating. Because it is a really captivating composition, as I'm sure you'll agree. Now, before I go on, I have to do the obligatory bit of the video. So I need to remind you that you could of course like this video if you enjoyed simply by clicking the little thumbs up icon and of course you could subscribe to this channel which is if you haven't yet it's just one click on the little button below the video and once you've done that there's a little bell icon that appears and you can click that as well and then you get notified anytime i make new videos and then you never have to miss anything so back to the picture maybe you've noticed that i've resisted calling this a painting and that is because it isn't that is it's not just a painting you see, the scream exists in various different forms. Over the course of 17 years, Munch made at least five different versions. Two in pastel, two in oil paint, and one lithograph. Now, the lithograph is, of course, a printing technique, and a limited series were printed. And frankly, I have no idea how many of those are left or where they are. But there's one of them in the Munch Museum in Oslo. Actually, that museum owns three versions, a painted one, a pastel one, and a lithograph. And the other painted version, which is this one, is in the National Museum in Oslo, which is only about four and a half kilometers away. And the last version, the remaining pastel, is owned by a private collector. So with all these different versions around, technically it should be referred to as a composition rather than a painting, unless you're talking about one of the specific versions. So, as I said earlier, the Scream has been seen as one of the first works of modern art and as the first work of Expressionism. And there's good reason for that, because this work was completely new when he started thinking of it back in 1892 or perhaps already in 1891. And it was first exhibited in 1893, and that's this version. At the time, there had of course been plenty of artists that were working in new and untried ways. There had been a wave of what we now call the post-impressionist, working all over Europe, but the most famous ones, I guess, worked in Paris. I'm talking about people like Van Gogh or Gauguin or Toulouse-Lautrec. And all of these artists were considered or called themselves avant-garde. And Vincent van Gogh had already died by the time the screen was first exhibited. And in later years, people often said about the work of Vincent van Gogh that he was the father of Expressionism. And this may be true. You see, the thing that he did is he painted pictures of things that he could see around him. But in every brushstroke you sense emotions and feelings, and that is what makes them so interesting. They express feeling as much as they express the visual world. Still, in all his work, Vincent van Gogh tried to make pretty pictures. And his paintings describe things that you can see and find in reality. So they can be classified in terms of portraits, landscapes, still lives, that sort of thing. But the screen is different. It's not a landscape, it's not a portrait, it's not a still life or any other classification you might think of. It is something completely new. It's a painting or composition that deals exclusively with the inner feelings of a person and not pretty feelings like love, for instance, but something that is closer to fear or anxiety or some other form of mental turmoil. And Munch gave us plenty of material to understand his work, so it's not difficult for us to interpret it. He described it on several occasions where he simply told us what it means and what he tried to convey. And I'll get to those descriptions and when I do, you will see, at least I think you will, that it's almost exactly what you expected. That is, I doubt that it will surprise you because what he made is pretty clear in its intentions, I think. By the way, many of these descriptions and much of the information we have about Edvard Munch, we have from his own writings because he kept diaries, but he often also wrote 
articles about his own work, and he sometimes even wrote on his paintings. And in much of his writings, he said that in his paintings, he dealt with his personal issues that stemmed from his childhood and the madness within him, which, which also came from his childhood in his words. Now, let me give you a little bit of background about the man himself. He was born in a town in Norway, but as a small child, the family moved to Oslo, which at the time was still called Christiania. His father was a physician and Edward was the second of five children. He was a sickly child, spent much time in bed, where he started drawing to entertain himself. But he wasn't the only one who was sick in the family, because when he was only seven years old, both his mother and sister died of tuberculosis. So he was left with his father, who was apparently obsessively and oppressively religious. Later in life, he would write in his diaries about his father, and I quote, From him I inherited the seeds of madness, the angels of fear, sorrow and death, stood by my side since the day I was born." End quote. His father apparently would tell his children that their mother was watching them, looking down on them from heaven and being sad about the way they behaved, which at least to me sounds decidedly unpleasant. And throughout his life, in his diaries, he would write about his fear of mental illness or him suffering of it. And some of his siblings had mental health issues as well, so it was an almost constant theme in his life. One of his sisters, for instance, was at several points in her life admitted to a mental hospital in the city. Now I only mention all of these things because they are important for his work. Because when Edward went to art school he was trained to paint in a more or less impressionist way but soon started experimenting with his own visual language. And he would call that visual language his soul painting. And by that he meant that it helped him make sense of his world and his inner feelings. It seems that the term soul painting really is almost the same thing as expressionism where the subject of a work of art is more concerned with inner feelings than outward appearance. He would, by the way, develop this idea of soul paintings while he was also working on more traditional work. I say this because we tend to think of the work of artists as if its development is linear. That is, that they go from one work to the next and with every work they progress in some sort of way. But of course, in reality, things are much more complicated because Munch was very capable at painting portraits and they helped pay the bills, so that's what he did. But in the meantime, he would also experiment with other things that would develop his own and very distinct style of, well, soul painting. And one of the very typical things about the work of Munch is that he would work on one composition and he would then return to it maybe one, maybe three, maybe five years later and make another version. And he didn't just do it with the screen, but with many other compositions he developed. For instance, this one. It's called Melancholy and it deals with the romantic troubles of a friend of his. And its first version was made well before the screen. We can see this character up front who's clearly dealing with heartache. He's sitting by the shore, which gives shape to the landscape. And in the distance, we see this pier with three people on it. They're not painted with much detail, but it seems a woman in a white dress and a man in a black suit. And a third person, I assume a man, carrying some oars, walking towards the boat at the end of the pier. They almost offset the melancholy mood because they're clearly doing something for fun. But at the same time, they almost function as a sort of thought bubble, as you see in comic books, like a memory of his lost love. Now, the version I show you here is not the first version made, but it's the one that's in a public collection. The first one ever made is in a private collection, so I don't have a high resolution picture of it. And he made various versions of it over a period of six or seven years, which actually overlaps the period in which he started making the screen. And it should be noted that he was quite successful as an avant-garde artist, also as a portrait painter, but those seem to be almost separate careers. But he exhibited his more modern work in Norway, in Denmark, and even in Berlin, which at the time was one of the centers for modern art. And he would be received with just the right amount of outrage from the public, which would be welcome because that meant publicity. And then he painted the screen. Now, as I said before, the screen was first exhibited in 1893, but he had started working on it at least a year earlier and probably more. And we know this from an entry in his diary. He wrote this in Nice on the 22nd of January of 1892. So more than a year before he exhibited the screen. And I quote, One evening I was walking along a path. The city was on one side and the fjord below. I felt tired and ill. I stopped and looked out over the fjord. The sun was setting and the clouds turning blood red. I sensed the scream passing through nature. It seemed to me that I heard the scream. I painted this picture, painted the clouds as actual blood 
the color shrieked. This became the scream. End quote. So when he wrote this, apparently he had already finished one form of the scream. And it may be this version, this pastel, which is usually regarded to be the first one he made. Even though in his diary he claims that he painted the first version. And another detail of the description is that he wrote this much later than his experience. Because the diary also states that he was in Nice in France at the time. But perhaps more importantly, if you read the quote, he says that he sensed a scream passing through nature, which means that the figure in front is not actually screaming. He's reacting to this scream passing through nature. He might be screaming as well, but that's not the scream in the title. And once you know this, it starts to make more sense. That is why the figure is covering his ears. And also we learn from it that the figure is supposed to be him, Edward Munch himself, but he clearly made very little effort to be visually accurate. And other than that, he describes the scene pretty much as we see it. I've often heard people talk about the scream as if they were walking along a pier, but no, it's a road with a fence. It's on a hill and it overlooks the city of Christiania, now Oslo. You can see the fjord with ships in it and they help to give depth. In some of the versions you can see some buildings in the city and I suppose that's Oslo Cathedral or the Domkirche, judging by the spire. The hill he is on must be the Ekeberg. At the time it was outside of the city, but the city has grown around it. And today, on that very same hill, there is actually a vantage point called Utsichtspunkt Skrit. Now I know I mispronounced that, but I don't speak Norwegian, sorry. But I assume it means vantage point screen. Now on this image from Google Maps, you can see where that vantage point is. And there's even a street view image there. And you can see they put up a frame to give you an idea of where he might have conceived of the picture. Others have claimed though that it's a little bit higher on the hill where there's a road instead of a walking trail. And since there's so little detail in the picture, I would argue that it really doesn't matter much. It could be somewhere a little bit to the right or to the left or higher or maybe even lower. But at the very least there should be a road or a path and a good view of the city. These days, by the way, from that very same vantage point, you cannot see the church anymore because buildings have been built in between and they've simply blocked the view. Now, the location, of course, is a beautiful place for a walk and a great place to be inspired for your paintings or both. But it may or may not be significant that further along the road, there was a mental hospital where, at the time, Monk's sister was a patient. And the scream obviously deals with mental health issues that clearly he thought apply to him as well. Remember the sentence that I started this video with? This could only have been painted by a madman. He actually wrote that on this version that was first exhibited in 1893. Obviously not in English, but in Norwegian. And it's written in the red sky top left with a pencil and it's barely legible. And apparently it was never very clear because it was first noticed in 1904 and was exhibited in Denmark. So we're not sure when Munch wrote this on the painting. Did he do it when he finished it or at some other later point? It was first assumed that it was some sort of vandalism by someone else, but was later determined that it was his handwriting. And sadly, no one ever asked Munch himself. And you would assume that they would have had ample opportunity. I mean, he died in 1944. So after the discovery, they had four decades to find out, but apparently didn't. Nowadays, it's assumed that he wrote it on the painting as a reaction to perhaps a bad critique of his work. He might have overheard someone say something like that and taken it to heart and added it to his painting. But it's not the only instance where he wrote something on his work, because one of the other versions, the pastel which is now in a private collection, has a description of the work on the frame. And that one says, and I quote, I was walking along the road with two friends. The sun was setting and suddenly the sky turned blood red. I paused, feeling exhausted, and leaned on the fence. There was blood and tongues of fire above the blue black fjord and the city. My friends walked on, and I stood there trembling with anxiety, and I sensed an infinite scream passing through nature." End quote. Now this is obviously quite similar to the first description, but a notable difference is that this one was made for the public. His diaries were not. He clearly wrote this for an audience. And although it's mostly the same, in this case he mentions the two friends he was with. They can be seen further along the road. Apparently he had fallen back and they walked on when he had this experience. But in the painting they serve another function. 
You see, they give scale. It's because of them that we can see how far away things are and have a sense of how big things are, especially when you see that they are next to the ships. And their difference in scale gives us much more information. And it also helps to sort of fix the composition. You see, the screen is much more than just this screaming figure. The road, the sky, the shape of the city and the fjord, they all help to make a big world with a small figure in the front. He's tiny, overwhelmed by this scream and the nature around him. Yet at the same time, everything converges on this figure. So although he's surprisingly small in the bigger picture, it is clear where the emphasis is. Which is a very clever way to set up a picture. People have often said that it looks as though he made it in a few minutes. And it actually might be true that it only took him a couple of hours or so to paint any of the versions. But coming up with the composition must have taken a lot more time and effort. And often we can't really appreciate it because most of the versions you'll see in popular culture will be cropped around the central figure. In this video I've been doing the same thing. I've been panning around the painting showing you details rather than the whole thing. But if you see the whole picture you see how small the figure actually is. Also if you look at these flowing lines they are surprisingly Jugendstil or Art Nouveau in shape. But then again that was the overwhelmingly popular form of art at the time. Now with a composition this famous, people are bound to start looking for the inspiration for every little detail in it. One of those things is the shape of this figure in the front. It's often been compared to a Peruvian mummy. During the 19th century, several of these mummies had been dug up and put on display. I'm going to show you one of these, and if you're squeamish, this is the time to look away. This is one that's now in a museum in Florence. And Munch may have seen it at some point when he visited the city. But that was after he had made his first screams. So this particular one was not the inspiration. But there had been another Peruvian mummy on display in an exhibition during the World Fair in Paris in 1889. And Munch had been there, but we cannot be sure whether or not he actually saw it, of course. Although it made a lot of headlines, it was kind of famous, and lots of artists went to see it. And for instance, Paul Gauguin used that very one, that particular one, in many of his paintings afterwards. And even though we cannot be completely sure whether or not Munch saw one of these mummies, his figure is very much reminiscent of one. And then of course there's this blood red sky. Some people have argued that it's the result of the eruption of Krakatoa. That had been a huge volcanic eruption in what is now Indonesia back in 1883, so 10 years before the first exhibition of the screen. It had been so big that it had shot up dust and particles all the way up in the stratosphere and as a result, there were spectacular sunsets and sunrises for many years to come. And not just around Indonesia, all around the globe. So undoubtedly Munch saw these spectacular sunsets and may have been inspired by them. But there are good arguments too that he did not use that experience for this work. The first is that historians like to blame pretty much every meteorological event in the decades after 1883 on the Krakatoa eruption. So it's a little bit of a lazy argument. Particularly because, and this is my second point, if this happened all the time, it wouldn't have scared him so much. This is supposed to be a fiery and red beyond what was normal. I mean, if this was an everyday occurrence, he wouldn't have mentioned it, now would he? And did you know that he used the very same sky from pretty much the same location in different paintings? This one is called Anxiety. And it is perhaps an even more clear reference to his sister and her problems in the nearby hospital. Now, obviously, these days, the scream has become extremely famous, even though it wasn't a huge success at first. Later generations have called it the Mona Lisa of the modern age. And of course, it has been used in all kinds of forms of popular culture. It has also been the most expensive artwork ever sold at auction at some point. That was back in 2012, when one of the pastels was sold to an American collector for 120 million US dollars. Now by now that record has been broken, but it was big news at the time. But for such a famous and now expensive work of art, it might surprise you that it was made with dirt cheap materials. Cheap pastels, cheap paint, and all of them are on cardboard. Now many artists at the time worked with these very cheap materials, but these days that makes it a huge challenge to conserve these images, especially when people keep trying to steal them. You see, two different versions were stolen at some point. The first one, the one in the National Museum, was stolen in 1994, only to be recovered a few months later. And the second instance this was done was in 2004. At that point, Two paintings were stolen from the Munch Museum. I guess I should say the old Munch Museum. But two paintings were stolen, and that was their painted version of the scream and 
this one. At that time, it took several years before they could get them back. But luckily, they are back. And these days, you can see one version still in the National Museum, which is the first painted one, and three of them in what is now the new Munch Museum, which actually is brand new. It opened in October 2021. It's a big museum that, according to their website, houses 26,000 works by Munch. This includes paintings, sketches, drawings, and photographs. But it's a staggering number of objects from a single artist. And I have to admit, I haven't been there yet. But I think that if you go up to the vantage point where the screen was supposedly conceived, that museum would be right there in your view. Now, as I said, they have three versions there, but you can only see one at a time. Two of them are kept in the dark and one can be seen, and every hour a different one is revealed. And I assume they do this to keep them in the dark for longer because that's better for their conservation. But it also means that if you want to see all three of them, you have to stay at least for three hours in that museum. And as I said, I haven't been there yet, but I've spoken to several people who have, and they were unanimous in saying that it's a wonderful museum, very much worth the trip. So hopefully I get the chance to go there at some point, and hopefully you do as well. And even though this is a video, of course, about one particular work by Edvard Munch, I hope that at least I've shown you some of his other works as well, and you can see that there's a lot more to him and his work than just the most famous stuff. Now, before you pack your bags and fly off to Oslo, don't forget to like and subscribe. You could, of course, really help my channel by even sharing these videos with anyone you think might be interested. And as always, I'd like to thank you very much for watching and hope to see you again soon.